Thank you. It's a great honor to be here and uh, so many friends. It's, it's like coming home. I, I lived in Aspen for, for many years and I miss it and it's a great place to be. So I'm very honored to be here at the Aspen Ideas Festival and to have you in the audience. Tonight, what I'd like to talk about is one of the most pressing issues of our time. There is a tsunami, great, there is a tsunami of destruction sweeping across the planet today. And that tsunami is the destruction of language and cultural diversity. Every two weeks, a traditional elder dies somewhere on the planet and takes with them a rich knowledge of culture, traditional practices, wisdom of medicines and local ecosystems, a deep understanding of climate and weather patterns, and the knowledge of potential cures to the diseases that are plaguing our planet. Of the 7,000 languages spoken today, a vast majority are oral and are not being taught to the next generation. Over 80% of those languages are expected to disappear by the end of the century. So when that elder dies, in fact, a whole ecosystem of intellectual diversity created over tens of thousands of generations disappears. As my friend and anthropologist Wade Davis states, this is like watching a library of knowledge burn to the ground every two weeks. We are living through a period of time where a vast database of human knowledge and cultural diversity is disappearing, not being passed on to the next generation, lost and undocumented. We speak of biological diversity, the need to preserve a seed, a bank of diverse DNA, a biological bank for the future. But what about cultural diversity, that rich tapestry of human knowledge that dates back to the time we first set out from Africa? Embedded in these ancient dialects, which make up the majority of those 7,000 languages, could be the keys to our survival in the 21st century and beyond. Yet we are letting that library of knowledge burn down every fortnight, cast off as if it was some relic from the past to be forgotten. So 30 years ago, with a curious heart, a gypsy soul, and a passion to photograph, I decided to commit my life to putting on film and video the disappearing traditional cultures still alive on the planet today. That journey began in these canyons of the Southwest Desert of America, where I discovered the ancient symbols, the mythology of Native Americans. In those religious markings, I saw an existence that I would eventually see repeated in traditional cultures around the world over and over. At that time in the early 1980s, I was Ansel Adams' last photographic assistant. What I learned from him was indeed art, the message of art, but also using photography as a social tool. I got the message from him that you could combine art and create a social message. And I think that's a lot of what you're seeing during this amazing festival, is where artists are taking on and becoming socially engaged. So after I finished the tenure of time at the Ansel Adams studio, I wanted to take off. And I started my journey, and it really hasn't ended. And one of the first places I went to was Varanasi, a city of light, the oldest city in India. For a Hindu to die in Varanasi naturally is to be ensured of the ultimate transformation into enlightenment, ending the cycle of karma. Each morning people come down to the Ganges, a river that flows from the high Himalayas to pray and bathe in the early bright white light of Varanasi. Varanasi is home to Lord Brahma, the creator, Lord Siva, the destroyer, the two most powerful Hindu gods. The struggle between these two forces is the struggle of good and bad, light and dark, divinity to Dante's Inferno. Here you will find the Lord of the untouchables, the keeper of the burning guts, and the spirit being that holds the key to a person's reincarnation. So too in Varanasi you will find the worshipers of Lord Rama tattooed across their entire being. And with the morning offerings to the river Ganges, a Hindu man can be assured life is again in karmic balance. Traveling north of Varanasi, you arrive in the high country of Tibet, where here in the great peaks of the Himalayas, the driving winds and absence of water leaves life clinging to the landscape. 
Here you step to the edge, and life has no room for extravagance. Here in the high mountains, it is possible to conclude that what you don't accomplish holds equal importance with what you do. Here, the absence of life and the void created by nature forces you to examine a spiritual, spiritual dimension that we in the West sometimes lose in our trips to the store and the bathroom mirror. Here in Tibet, dreams of material possession and accomplishment are tinged with dark futility. After several trips to the Himalayas, I decided to stay longer, and I ended up living in a monastery for three months there, slowing down until the object of my attention affirmed its presence. I stepped into a, a state of mind where I wanted to peel away from the cliches and get to the essence of the culture. I took on Buddhism, I'm still a Buddhist, but I wanted to slow down and really see the culture for the way it was, not my Western perception. And that's what I love about travel. That's what I love about this profession. My camera is the passport. It's about going to places and reserving judgment. This symbol right here, a very charged symbol, obviously from the 20th, uh, 20th century. That symbol, in fact, the Hindu word for that symbol is swastika. Those four dots in the middle are the four elements of life. That is one of the most sacred symbols to Buddhists, Hindus, many, many indigenous cultures around the world. So for me, photography, travel, is about reserving judgment, stepping into another culture, and discovering things. Reserving judgment, discovering things. So across the Tibetan plateau, you see these Mani walls that are often a mile long, and each and every one of those rocks are etched with the Tibetan chant, O Mani Padmi Hum, which loosely translated means, O Buddha, give me eternal life. As you come off the Himalayas into the east, you arrive in one of the largest nations in the world, the Pacific Ocean, Polynesia. I've spent a lot of time there photographing. I did a book called Ancient Marks, following the flow of ink around the world in search of traditional tattooing. One of the epicenters of that is the South Pacific. This is a Maori from New Zealand at Milford Sound. And like so many traditional cultures around the world, he dances in two worlds. His traditional world, that is a mocha, that is a spiritual mask. But you notice the cross on his forehead. He's Christian as well. And for a lot of us, we dance in parallel realities of science and religion and so many, many cultures exist like this. Uh, during the period of time, I've worked at the National Geographic, Wade Davis, and I did a series of documentaries. One of them was on the wayfinders, the ancient tradition of being able to navigate for thousands of miles across the ocean. This is a young man who has gone through initiation of being a wayfinder, and his rite of passage is the traditional tattooing of the, the, the prow of a canoe tapped into his body. So the way that they do that is they have a stick, a shark's tooth, and they tap it in. The Polynesian word for tattooing is tata. It's the sound of the tattooing going in. And in fact, when Captain Cook and his sailors arrived there in the 16th and 17th century, they have got tatad, they took it back to Europe, bastardized the word to tattooing, and that's how tattooing was reintroduced into modern European culture and consequently kind of lived in this fringe state until very recently where tattooing has essentially gone very mainstream and sort of a part of a modern primitive movement. So as you pass through the Pacific Ocean, you end up in a place, one of my favorite places, Peru, one of the sacred landscapes of the world, Machu Picchu, and also the Nazca Lines, this amazing array of symbols and patterns and animals uh, scattered across this desert location north of Lima. And you continue on and you arrive in Africa, one of my places, favorite places to work. My father is South African. I grew up in part in South Africa in the Middle East. And I was given an assignment to photograph the archeological ruins uh, along the Nile Basin. As I often try and do, I try to go to these PowerPoints like the Taj Mahal, Machu Picchu, the pyramids on a full moon. This is the day after a full moon. I had gotten permission to sleep up on one of the pyramids. 
As often happens in January, February in this part of the world, there was a mist in the morning, and this is just before I get into my vehicle. I turn around, cast my eyes over my shoulder, and the mist had burned off. I fell in love with the Sahara Desert. I wanted to stay on longer. If you linger long enough at Giza, you'll see the Bedouins coming out of the desert on their camels from as far away as Libya, Egypt, Western Egypt, and they just get off their camels in euphoria and pray to the pyramids. I wanted to stay longer in the desert. I put together an expedition. Uh, Tim Cahill, a noted uh, travel writer, and I put together an expedition. We headed out of Timbuktu, which is in the western part of the Sierra, the Sahara, out of Mali, and we headed north, an ancient camel caravan. And for the first couple of days through the translator, they kept talking about needing to find the eye of the needle. And I kept asking, what do you mean the eye of the needle? Come to find out all of the sand dunes in the Sahara Desert run east and west. And the only safe place to take the camels around the sand dunes was this place, the eye of the needle. You would arrive in these mysterious villages, these men wrapped up in their turbans, uh, unemployed bandits running uh, stolen cars and petrol and cigarettes from North Africa down to Black Africa. If you lingered on a Friday, you'd see the men gathering outside of the mosque. They'd step inside, they'd have their Quranic studies, and then they would go off to the side, find a shaft of light, and read their Quran in privacy. If you were even more lucky, you might be there at the end of Ramadan or during a wedding, and the women paint themselves with henna. And then we would travel often late afternoon into the evening because much like the West now, 100, 120 degrees, too hot to travel in the middle of the day. So we would travel early morning, late afternoon, and often in the moonlight. And then you arrive at Taladanias, this ancient salt mine where there's still today black African slaves working away, chipping away at the salt. They uh, produce these salt blocks the camels rest, and then they load up the salt and head back down to Timbuktu to sell it. This tradition has gone on for generations, for well over 400 years. The, the fathers take their sons in as their fathers took them into the desert, and it becomes a social weave of a fabric that keeps the culture together. Introduce modernity, introduce vehicles, and that fabric begins to unravel like so many traditional cultures are experiencing around the world. Every afternoon, our guide would step onto the top of the sand dune and chart, much like the wayfinders in Polynesia, chart their navigation through the desert. No compasses. And if you missed the well that we needed to get to the next day, imminent catastrophic danger would unfold. Camels would die, we would die. So these guys have navigated for thousands of generations using the stars, the patterns, the shadows on the sand dunes. You head further south in Mali and you end up in the Dogon community, the Dogon culture. This is one of the last uh, animistic traditional cultures in this area that withstood that onslaught of Islam that came down from North Africa. When the young initiates go through their initiation from childhood into adulthood, they wear this Sergei mask, this mask, and as they dance, they become the conduit from the spiritual world to the earthly world, and the messages from the gods travel through their mask. You head further south and you arrive in the country of Burkina Faso. My interest was the masks in this area. This is one of the great epicenters of primitive masks. Much of the artists of the Cubist period reference these masks from this area. While my interest was indeed with the masks, it was also where the skin is too dark to tattoo, they scar. And there is indeed scarification in this part of the world. I would often ask for the most handsome man, the most beautiful woman, and inevitably they would bring the most scarred. Many tribal cultures around the world believe that the human body is merely a canvas for a story to be told. As you experience cultural stories and experiences through the life, you are marked, you are tattooed, you are scarred. And this is evident even today in many cultures. You head south, you arrive in the Indibeli tribe in the northern part of South Africa. And while they do not tattoo or scar, the women wear these 
controversial rings of brass around their neck. Their neck. No, not so much stretching their neck, but more pushing down their shoulder blades. It is a sign of wealth, it's a sign of initiation, and it is a tradition that still goes on today. You head on up the eastern coast of Africa and you arrive in Ethiopia, in the Omo Valley, where the Mercy tribes, where the young girls have their lip slit as a young girl and a plug is inserted and a larger and larger plug is, in, is um, inserted as you marry and you gain wealth and status within the community. Up in the northern part of Ethiopia, again, surrounded by a sea of Islam, are Coptic Christians. This is in Lalabella, this amazing, beautiful rock church that is approximately in the background 50 feet by 50 feet, secret entrance, and this is the priest with the Coptic cross. My interest was in the archaeological site there, but it was also in the tattooing. The women and the men are very handsome there. The women are beautiful, and she has a Coptic cross tattooed on her forehead and down her chest. Probably about 15 years ago, my wife and I, Shanda, took a trip into Serengeti, on the edge of Serengeti. I wanted to have one of those experiences of going home. Science has proven that we stood up at one point and walked out of Africa. We all came from this part of the world. I wanted to go home. I wanted to see what this place was, as if it was the day after creation. Hired Jackson on the right-hand side, a Maasai who went to Nairobi, got tired of modernity, came back, and was being groomed as one of the chiefs of his village. We spent five amazing days on the outer edge of Serengeti, just walking, camping under the stars, firing him with questions, lions, elephants, no guns, just merely his red fabric and his sword. And then on the last night, under the stars, he said, Chris, I've, I've answered a lot of your questions. I have some questions for you. I said, I'll try. And he said, what are your initiation rituals in your culture? What do you do with your elders when they're too old to herd the cattle? What do you do to preserve the land for future generations? I was stumped. I really can't answer that question in any legitimate fashion. And in fact, he had heard and read about the Navajo here in the southwest desert of America, where not only do they preserve the land for the next generation, but for seven generations. And I'll loop back to that story shortly. In 1985, I had the opportunity to go to New Guinea. New Guinea is an island just north of Australia. Um, during my upbringing, I had lived in Australia for many years, and my father talked about this exotic land of Stone Age cultures, cultures lost in valleys where they had not had contact yet. And I was intrigued with this place. So in 1985, I had an assignment, and I arrived, and of course I fell in love with this place. I wanted to come back. I wanted to truly experience cultures where the masks still dance. Eventually ended up doing a long-term project, became an exhibit, a book, and it's titled Where Masks Still Dance. Cultures that were still alive with the beat of the forest, spiritual connections, rituals around birth and death and war, filled with initiation rituals. This gentleman right here, living in Port Moresby, has come back to his village on the Sepik River where he's getting initiated into his warrior status. He's already been initiated, obviously, into adulthood, and he is painted, he's baptized in the river and then taken into the spirit house. I, for over 10 years, would set aside approximately four or five months each year, go to New Guinea, and travel by dugout canoe or fly up to a runway, put together an expedition, and spend three, four weeks hiking back in. I systematically deconstructed both Irian Jaya, which is the western part of New Guinea, which is a Indonesian province, and Papua New Guinea into 19 areas. And I went there, and my mission was really to photograph the last remaining vanishing tribes of New Guinea. So several trips in, I was up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, some 500 miles from the coast, and this woman was preparing for a wedding. 
And I noticed that she had this shell on her chest. Now, in most parts of New Guinea, people do not leave their valley. In fact, it's very rare for them to go into the next valley. In fact, in New Guinea, there are over a thousand languages, not dialects, languages, unique language systems. That unique aberration of history is based upon them staying in their valleys and continuing to be there. So I knew she hadn't been to the coast, was with an anthropologist, and through the dot pattern on the top of the shell, we had figured that shell had been traded over 300 years from the coast. Incredible experience. So probably about halfway through my trip, I'm in Irian Jaya, the western part, several weeks from the runway, and I had heard that this young lad was going to get initiated. I wanted to photograph it. The day before this image was taken, I had hiked up and over that hill down into the valley, and as I was coming up to the top, I noticed this elder sitting there, smiling, and I walked up and I sat down, and through a translator, he said, which valley are you from? And I smiled and I said, wow, many, many, many valleys away. And he kept persisting. He kept asking, which valley are you from? And then in, eventually he answered the question himself. He smiled and he said, and obviously I had to have it translated, I know, you're from where the green meets the blue. He had heard of this place, the color of the sky when the land ended was blue, obviously the ocean. And I wrote that down in my journal, and I've pondered on that often, because in a way, we're all from where the green meets the blue. We're from this small, fragile ecosystem, this planet spinning through space. I was very fortunate in January of this year to be at a symposium very similar to the Aspen Ideas Festival on stage with an astronaut who had literally been one of the last astronauts in the shuttle system, and she had spent a significant time up there at the space station. And she came up to me afterwards and said, yeah. You know, I'd sit there and I'd look out at space, this vast space, and then I'd turn around and look at this small little planet. We're all from where the green meets the blue. So several years into my trip, I came across this amazing elder. He had the birds of paradise, which are their very highly coveted and respected feathers. And I noticed this old man with this beautiful plumage of a costume, and he was looking up at a tree. And I looked up at the tree, and the tree was full of birds of paradise. And I did a very Western thing. Through my translator, I said, how many birds up there? So he went back, translated the elder back, and I could see there was some confusion. And eventually, with great embarrassment, the translator said, Chris, we don't have words for numbers. And I could have very easily said, well, this is obviously a primitive culture. And then I stopped because I realized that if I was to go further into the forest, I had to learn to ask the right questions. We are ethnocentric. We look at the world through our prism. And of course, other realities look absurd, wrong, primitive. And if anything I've learned from traveling, it is to go further into the forest, to listen, reserve judgment, and begin to ask the right questions. So along the Sepik River, which is on the northwest coast, northeast coast, excuse me, of uh, Papua New Guinea is the middle Sepik River. In the middle of the Sepik River, they worship the crocodile. In fact, they believe all man came from the mouth of the crocodile, to the point where the young boys are initiated into the crocodile clan. They are slit and they form this kind of skin of the crocodile. And so this was actually my inspiration to go on and eventually do a book on tattooing and scarification, was to see the abundant amount of scarification in New Guinea and the abundant amount of tattooing. In another part of Irian Jaya on the western side, isolated up near Anguric, when someone passes away, they chop the fingers off to remind them of that elder. This woman is missing four fingers. I was recently there about a year ago, and I saw this young girl, probably no more than seven or eight years old, with one of her fingers chopped off. A tradition that still continues. As much as they have 
peace, they have war. And it is very much woven into the fabric of their society. In fact, it's very ritualized. So I once asked a chief, why do you go to war? And he answered me in this order, pigs, land, and women. <laughs> so if a pig is stolen, a woman is stolen, someone puts some agriculture on your land, you agree to disagree, and you agree to come to this location and it's payoff time. So some equilibrium has to come back within the complex fabric of the culture. This is up in Anguric, the highlands of Irian Jaya, these incredible raton costumes with these penis sheaves. I can tell you the penis sheaves have no utilitarian value whatsoever. Just to imagine young stud, Corvette, Porsche showing off. So during this period of time that I was doing this documentation, I was actually also working for Time Magazine as a war correspondent, often sort of coming straight from Sarajevo or other places doing my project. I had heard while I was in New Guinea that there was going to be a ritualized battle. I wanted to document this. And just before I went in, I got a call from Time Magazine. They said, would you be in Sarajevo in five weeks? We're rotating out a photographer. We want you back in there. And I agreed, put my backpack on, headed on in, and spent about a week photographing again this ritualized battle, getting right into the thick of it. And again, somebody had been killed, so that went back and forth to eventually someone else on the other tribe was killed. Once that happened, they were all friends again. The payback, the balance had, had happened. I hiked out, got on a plane, flew to Europe, and flew into Dante's Inferno, Sarajevo at the worst of the Bosnian War. And it was several days into my experience that it struck me. What an amazing experience. I'd gone from a Stone Age culture of war to modern Europe and war. We had the conceit that we've actually evolved, that we no longer are primitive. In fact, the only thing we've evolved is the sophistication of how we kill ourselves. Look at Syria today. Down on the southwest coast of Irian Jaya, the Asmat area, is a village. A village where Michael Rockefeller disappeared. Some of you in this room know the story, 1962. Fascinating story. I had grown up to that story. And in fact, when I went in there, I spent a lot of time with the missionary who he was staying with that actually was with him the day he disappeared. So if anybody wants to hear this, the true story of Michael Rockefeller, uh, buy me a drink at the bar and I'll share you the information. I was fascinated in this area because it's one of the great epicenters of New Guinea art. If any of you are from New York or have been to the Metropolitan, you know the Rockefeller family has built this amazing wing and some of the great art of New Guinea from this location that Michael was actually collecting at the time uh, is in that wing and I highly encourage you to, to see that. So I spent several days down there, uh, very warlike uh, culture, and this is one late afternoon, and they were kind of doing exercises out into um, the, uh, the ocean, and I took this photograph. As much as they believe in life, they also believe in the afterworld. They believe that you come back in from the afterworld. When someone dies in a village, the women will cover themselves in mud, they'll go into mourning, and often they'll put anywhere up to 200 strands of Job's tears, these beads, around their neck. For each day, they will take off one of those strands, and the mourning process can last anywhere up to three quarters of a year. In another part, in the Asmat area again, the woman's husband has passed away. No one is allowed to look at her face, and uh, for a long period of time, the two brothers have shaved their heads. Most interestingly is the raton necklace, is the symbolic connection to the spirit of the deceased person. It is only after that raton necklace falls off is the spirit free to go into the afterworld. 
So for many years, I traveled with one particular guide, and he happened to come down with cerebral malaria on one of our expeditions and passed away. We took his body back to his village, and in his village, what they do to honor him or anybody that passes away is they build a spirit canoe. Each one of those shapes on the top of the spirit canoe is one of the totems from their clan, their village, their family, and at sunset, they push the spirit canoe off into the sunset and he journeys into the afterworld. So one of the great privileges of being a traveler, being an explorer, is to have the possibility in this period of time of history to make contact, to be able to be humbled enough to be in an experience where you're making contact with a culture that has never seen a Westerner or a white person. So we had figured out that there was a possibility up in one particular area. It's called the Bird's Head of New Guinea. Again, Irian Jai up in the northwest part, where there was a high probability in this one valley that there were probably tribes that had never been contacted. So we waited to the very end because it was a restricted area within the Indonesian government. You're not allowed in there. Put together an expedition. We snuck in and took about three weeks to get there. And indeed, they had never seen white people before. We had this amazing experience. Spent about 10 days there documenting them through a series of three or four translators. Had the chance to um, document a lot of their traditional stories, their language. We broke bread, so to speak. We created friends. On the very last day, I'm sitting there, camera equipment away. I've got my notepad, beautiful sunny afternoon, kids playing around me. Thunderstorm rolls up the valley. They get out their very fashionable raton bamboo uh, or uh, banana leaf uh, raincoats. The storm passes. It's late afternoon. The sun is setting. And I look up in the sky, and some 30,000 feet above me is a jet on its way from Sydney probably to Tokyo. And it struck me, what an amazing moment to be alive that we have people that still live with one foot in the Garden of Eden, beyond the frayed edge of the map. And yet we have all this technology. We have the ability to zoom around the world and tweet and Facebook and communication. What a privilege to be alive. What a privilege for all of us to be alive at this crossroads of human evolution. So here we are deep in the 21st century. Let us take one last look over our shoulder at the millennium behind us. What cultural traditions do we leave behind and which ones do we carry with us into this new century of technology and information and profound cultural choices? How will these new tools affect us? Using the internet, the Navajo elder is already sharing his stories with Jackson, my Maasai guide. While an Ethiopian priest, after his first prayers and before the morning light falls on his computer, will be emailing his shaman friend in Asia. And why not? There are cyber cafes in Timbuktu, smartphones in the jungles of New Guinea, and indeed we are all a part of a modern planet yearning now more than ever for a dialogue among civilizations. Let us use this new technology to celebrate ancient traditions, to build profound bridges of communication, and share the stories of cultures living on the edge that lie deep in the desert of our existence. So what does this new technology look like for traditional societies? Presently, there's approximately 1.2 billion smartphones on the planet, predominantly in the Western world, but a fair amount of penetration in India and China. It's estimated that within 10 to 12 years, three to four billion more smartphones will be moving into what I call the majority of the world. Hopefully they will be connecting those cultures of 7,000 languages to smartphones and tablets. In fact, the use of cell and tablets to transfer data of information globally has now surpassed the internet. We are now living in an age where the vast majority of the world is communicating cellular and not through internet. 
So when I go into these cultures and these isolated communities that are desperate to not be left behind, that are desperate to come on board and communicate, what are their needs? Emergency medical information, education, job opportunities, cultural language preservation. They are witnessing their oral traditions pass away with the elder. In fact, we got a call about five years ago by a tribe in Australia, an Aborigine culture. And they were desperate for us, our team, to come and document the two last speakers, two women that were in their late 80s, that were the last sole speakers of a language that was 30,000 years old. And so we went, and we spent about five, six days wandering in the forest with them, recording their stories, recording their mythology. They'd lean down, pick up a plant, and they'd say, when, it, when the mosquitoes start, we chew on this and we don't get sick. When we were young girls, we'd chew on this and we could fool around with the men and not get pregnant. Amazing stories. So this is what this technology has an opportunity to do. Many traditional societies desire to preserve their community and to have it stay intact, not draining their intellectual diversity off to the urban ghettos of the world. The traditional model is you get an education, and then you move to the city. But that doesn't happen in the sense of them getting a job. Often they unravel and they're at the lowest end of the economic ladder and they fall into the ghettos that we've seen in Cairo and Lima and so many parts of the world. Translation is a huge issue. If they speak another language and the predominant language of the internet and the cell technology is English, there is a problem. In fact, we are connecting with the folks at Google Translation. Imagine, if you could, the majority of those 7,000 languages in a Google app in the next five to 10 years. They're working on it. We're working with smartphone companies like Nokia and Apple, loading up apps that we then take into communities that invite us, and I stress invite us only. Those apps are language documentation. Educational tools. If any of you uh, watched the, uh, the panels this afternoon on MOOCs, imagine a MOOC, which is a massive online course, but imagine a MOOC in multiple languages, a MOOC that could create courses for jobs, a sustainable model where they weren't forced to move to the city, apps that do video and recording languages and spoken by the elders. And we're doing that now. We have created this technology where we train people and go into communities and let them do their own documentation. 50% of the world's population live in urban and city environments. 50% of the world's population now live in urban and city environments. That number will continue to rise to 65 to 70% in the next 35 years. This migration is devastating traditional cultures. The United Nations is working on ways to, to find ways to allow people to stay in their communities. The technology can help this crisis. Again, access to education, jobs, sustainable models for communities to thrive and exist. So as we race ahead in a modern world with our technological achievements that imply we're making the world flat, we must also keep our eyes focused on the last mile, that place where traditional societies are yearning to be a part of the dialogue. Let us not create another form of colonialism, a cultural divide of the digital. Also, as we create global languages of commerce, let's not forget the language of culture, the language of diversity, the world of multiple cultural realities, multiple languages. Obviously, English permeates the, the, the culture of commerce around the world. But what about other ways of looking at it? And as my friend Wade Davis often talks about, great, you want a common language around the world? Make it Yoruba, make it Quechua, make it a language that you don't understand 
and you'll realize what the majority of the world feels left out on the other side. So in 2000, I was hired by the National Geographic to take on the concept of culture and work on the notion of empowering underrepresented cultures. One of our main programs was to identify highly endangered languages, languages that if nothing was done within five years, it would collapse. We took the model of the biospheric hotspot list and created the language hotspot list. Again, these are hot zones where if language is not documented, empowered, revitalized, there'd be a huge collapse. And we are still continuing to do that documentation. Where invited, we go in with computers and cameras and video cameras, working with local anthropologists and linguists. We identify those elders and we empower people to do their own documentation. We've done a number of workshop programs. We often work with the, uh, the Indian Language Institute down in Santa Fe. We've brought in groups from New Guinea, Paraguay, India, Africa. We gather people and we give them communication skills. Since so much of the world's languages are oral, the concept of storytelling is quite amazing. I don't know if any of you were over in the storytelling um, a seminar earlier today. Language, written language, has only been around for 200 years, but we've been telling stories. We've been communicating with language for hundreds of thousands of years. It's hardwired in us to tell stories. So there are many cultures that know how to tell stories. So our workshops are about connecting to the internet, using social media, and empowering people to tell their own stories. These workshops where there are oral languages, we help them phonetically break down that language into a written form and share some of their great stories. Now there are stories that are only for the initiated and certainly we have no right to put that intellectual information out on the web unless they give us permission. And so what we did is that we created a website for them, not for the public, for them, password sensitive. So you go to a place like uh, the Dreamtime culture of the Aborigines, and there are women's stories that the men are never allowed to hear, vice versa, and there's all sorts of different complex rituals around not sharing that information, but they wanted to load it up. So we created passwords for them and all of the different rituals. You'll notice we're working with Google Translate. So People now are communicating around the world, uploading images, sharing ideas, and using this website as a database, as an archive for future generations. We've also coupled with YouTube, and we have created our, our own sort of presence on YouTube. And many of these videos that they are creating, they upload onto the web for your consumption. So you can go to Enduring Voices on YouTube and you'll see many of these stories. It was interesting, I'll do a little sidestep here. I, when we were in Australia, I talked to the Australian government. They have a very robust uh, program where they give grants to young Aborigine kids to use their traditional languages. The gentleman who ran that program said it failed. They didn't care about grandma's language yet but they wanted to be in a rap band. So the light bulb went off in his mind one day, and he said, okay, I'll give you a grant. You can buy all the musical instruments. I'll promote your rap band, whatever you want, if you do the lyrics in the traditional language. Program took off. It's wildly successful. It's being modeled around the world. If you don't make it relative to the younger generation, then it dies away. And so this is a lot of what we're being aware of and many NGOs are working around this notion of if you want the younger generation to speak that language, make it relative and relevant. On this website, there's all sorts of resources. You can go in and understand all these different groups that are working on language empowerment. I have formed my own nonprofit because in many of these places, they would often ask me, well, we're not a highly endangered language, but we're so desperate 
to get not left behind in the digital divide. So I've created a nonprofit organization, the Last Mile Technology Program, where we create opportunities. We take in computers, we cameras, videos, uh, very simple, simple technology, simple uh, teaching techniques, and we empower people to tell their own stories. This is a project that I continue to do up on the um, leeward side in the shadow of Everest. So climate change has created these moraine lakes up in and around Everest that are natu unnaturally building up. And it's not if, it's only when these will catastrophically break and tens of thousands of people down valley will be killed. The Sherpas are concerned. We've been building internet uh, link ups with them, bringing in solar, connecting them to the web, teaching them storytelling techniques, letting them tell their own stories, getting out of the way and letting them tell their stories. Just finished coming back from Botswana and the San Bush women have a co-op and they wanted to create a website. They've got all these amazing baskets that you can see on the left-hand side and they wanted to be able to sell it. So we're creating a website for them. Did a couple of days training going back in January and giving them an opportunity to take their own arts and crafts into their hands and sell it. I work with a number of organizations including the American Prairie Reserve. Sean Garrity is here in the audience. He'll be lecturing tomorrow. I highly encourage you to go see that lecture. And there's a number of tribes on the edge of the preserve in northern Montana, the Assiniboine, the Lakota. We're working with them to empower them. The number one thing that they want is job opportunities. So through the web, there are possibilities of education and being able to stay in your own community. This is not my image. This is a classic image, the Afghani girl, one of the great iconic images of the 20th, 21st century of our lifetime. White male photographer sent by National Geographic, one of the great photographers. But today I'm more interested in what an Afghani girl would do with the camera in her hands. We created a program called All Roads, giving grants for underrepresented photographers from Iran to Afghanistan. One of our winners was Farzana Hadid, one of the first graduates from a post-Taliban school of media, and we empowered her. Now she's working for the New York Times, having all sorts of success. I'm interested in that dialogue. I'm not interested in it being either Steve or her. We now, with this technology, have the ability to add extra seats at the table of the human dialogue. That's the century that we're living in now. So we continue the program. I've incorporated it into last mile technology. I was just in Japan. Nikon is taking on the sponsorship of Global Voices. We've had amazing photographers from Nusha and Tenzing. This incredible photographer from Inner Mongolia, he is a, a nomad, he spends six years, uh, six months of the year out, and then he comes back into the city and he documents his own culture, an akatendi. You know, we load a, thou a billion images a day around the world onto the internet. In fact, China alone loads 350 million images. We've created a new global language the language of photography. And I think it's an incredibly exciting now time now that is going on in photography. And for many photographers, it's a little bit daunting, but I think it has become a global language. It has become a way that we all speak to each other. So I'd like to end tonight with a quote from my first book, Keepers of the Spirit. So as the chainsaws fell the last trees that hide the first people, we are alive at an amazing moment in human evolution. The rich tapestry of human culture, that fabric that is made up of the dazzling array of man's diversity, is at a crucial crossroads. Will we as a species let go and sever that fragile umbilical cord to our primeval past, finding ourselves truly alone without cultural purpose, adrift, and a vast sea of space with nowhere to go? Or will we make a different choice? 
It is my hope that we can all gather around the digital fireplace of humanity and continue for generations to tell the stories of what it means to be alive on a planet that has survived the 21st century. Margaret Mead, the great anthropologist, once said, having been born into a polychromatic world of cultural diversity, her greatest fear is that our children will wake up in a monochromatic world not have a, having ever known that there was anything else. So thank you very much. Indeed, it's a race against time, and I hope you can join us. We need your help. So if anybody in the audience is connected to the technology world or has great ideas, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few moments if there are any questions, and I'm happy to answer them. If uh, people are leaving, my book is for sale outside, and I'm happy to sign it at the end of the Q&A period. Are there any questions? We have a question over here. Are you, uh, hello? I don't think it's on. Is the mic on? Hello, hello, there we are. Just speak up, yes, Hi. thanks. Uh, my name is Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Um, first of all, it was fabulous. Thank you. Fabulous. Uh, Last Mile Initiative, are you yes. familiar with Last Mile Initiative and microfinancing that is being done all over these areas around the world, and how does that connect with what you're doing? Completely separate. That word, Last Mile, is a term that's used often. There's actually even a website, Last Mile, and it is within the prison system. San Quentin, things like that. So there's, there's a number of us jockeying for a position on the internet. But, but the microfinance part is what I was referring exactly. to. Exactly. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I'm not related to that. Kiva.org, are you familiar with Kiva.org? Very similar. Microfinancing within traditional cultures and underrepresented cultures. Yes. Microphone coming up. Thank you. I agree, it was riveting. Can you speak further about how to compel or motivate the youngest speakers of a language that may be threatened, particularly when they don't see the value in preserving that, that mother language? It's interesting. Just by us arriving, often they suddenly realize, wow, they've come from halfway around the world. Maybe this is important. So. There is a lot of examples of a mass migration to revitalization. I am actually optimistic, because I think many of the elders are realizing this is it. This is the last stand. This is the final stake. And many young people want to stay in their communities, want to keep their culture and their traditions alive. And they're seeing this craziness of what's going on outside the world. Or like Jackson, they go to Nairobi, they get an education, very disillusioned in modernity. Not enough of it is happening. We are losing you know, a catastrophic amount of languages, as we are, of biological diversity. But I am optimistic that there seems to be a shift. There seems to be an empowerment. You know, I think globally we're, we're dealing with a, a very interesting phenomenon of cultures stepping back into their traditional ways. And I'm even naive enough to think that I think they will be the wisdom keepers that may even inform us of some things. Another question. Question up here, if we could have the microphone. Did I answer your question? Sort of. Hello, um, my name is Joyce, I'm from Los Angeles. And so, so many of these images, these people seem so stoic <laughs> and, and therefore so, so much more, even more foreign, not just because of their culture, but the way they look. And I wanted to know if the time that you spent with them, did you recognize aspects of their behavior or their culture that you could, that there were any sort of similarities between their culture and our, in our culture, Ameri you know, uh, sort of, Western civilization? Or? Absolutely. Several questions in there. I think, uh, you know, the more I travel, and I'm, I'm paid to find the differences. I'm paid to go and, and photograph the exotic, the different. And after 30 years of being on the road, I've come to the conclusion that we're all very similar. 
There, there isn't that many differences. You just need to find the common ground. You know, We all want to survive. We all want our community to thrive. We all want to look after our kids. So it's, it's actually very interesting how quickly, even, even when there is a communication issue, but non-verbally, you can arrive at a point of a common dialogue. And then, you know, so many of the photographs ha that I show have a, a stoic quality, a, a quality, you know, in photography, you evolve to the point where, regardless of where you point your lens, it becomes a self-portrait. And I realized after a period of time that it will always be my perspective. Now, I don't mind that, I'm an artist, but you know, the conceit of anthropology and visual anthropology is that that is the absolute truth. There's a trend now in anthropology of, much like what we're doing, empowering people to tell their own stories, to get out of the way and let them talk about their own culture. And I think there's a very exciting trend going on around that. Many voices. Yes, microphone over here. Um, I, I found out about my, um, my culture when I was about 12, and I, I was able to journey home to Cape Verde in 2009. Mm. And we have uh, 10 islands, nine are occupied. We have nine different dialects of Cape Verdean Creole. There's a move now to, um, to standardize the language, but, you, but then there's 10 languages, <laughs> 10 different dialects. Uh, just a, a question on how to, I've been trying to get my children to speak hmm. Cape Verdean Creole. And there's a little pushback from the youth because they just want to feel normal in the American culture. Can you say something about how, you know, how you can get like my little grandson who's 10 years old and I tell him, Shintali, you know, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he sits down, <laughs> you know, but he knows what I'm talking about, yes. and, but then he sits down, you know, Shintali. So I, you know, I'm trying to, you know, translate this to the next generation and get them to um, move in that direction. And it came from a woman who was dying in 2000 who said to me in Creole, and for some reason I understood everything she said even though I was raised here and didn't grow up with the language at all. She said, Cape Verde is your mother. Hmm. She said, learn your language, learn your culture, Learn your food, learn to cook, and teach it to your children or your mother will die. You know, so this has been what's inspired me to go back and to start learning that. And I think that even, we have many cultures here of, from Europe, all over the place. We're a land of immigrants. Right, we're all a land of immigrants and we really need to go back and go deep into our culture and not just let America be the culture, because we're a land of many cultures, but we don't actually practice them. That's what I'm Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. And it is a challenge, but I, I think you noted it, the mother, and another quote, the Margaret Mead quote, you know, letting, letting your children, I have a seven and a half year old son that's growing up in American culture, and I, I'm determined to take him to, my father's South African, my mother Canadian, is to go to the roots. You know, the worst thing is to, to be in that monochromatic world and never know that there was any diversity. And I think there's a point where at some point in your life, you want to go back to the roots. And giving them the knowledge of where that is, is important. We have time for one more question. Two more questions, the two of you in the back. Yes, very quickly, sorry. Hello? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm an ecology and biodiversity major and an anthropology minor. And Your plate is full. <laughs> yes, I suppose. And I see a connection between the rise of unique and different cultures and a connection between the different types of ecologies and ecosystems that they rise from. Um, my question is, what exactly does your project do to address or kind of highlight that preserving the environment also helps preserve people in terms of the health of the environment and the health of the people and its Great future question. preservation. Great question. Uh, when we created the language hotspot list, 
And we worked very co closely with the organization called Conservation International, which had coined the biological hotspot list, hotspot list. There is actually data now showing up, there's a correlation of when you bring culture back, the, the biosphere comes back. There, and we'll be talking, Sean and I have a panel tomorrow evening at eight o'clock in the Hotel Jerome, I encourage you to come. And we're gonna be talking about land and culture working together. And there are clear examples where national parks, preserves, wilderness areas are set aside and the intention is to incorporate the indigenous people. And where that is done, there is a wonderful sustainable model and the culture and the language thrives, revitalizes, and maintains themselves. It's much like my project where masks still dance. We've all gone to the museums, we've seen those masks. I was more interested to see it in con context. You cannot take a people off the land. We all suffer from nature deficit disorder because we're disconnected from land. And I think that's true with indigenous cultures. There's another question right there. Well, yes. Xiao uh, Xiao, MIT Media Lab, thank you for the really inspiring talk. Um, so I've had to learn more than one language in my life. And what I've learned from all going through all of that is that to learn a language, it's not just about the abstract information of the language, yes. but about the whole package of living life, relationship to the world, um, orientation of your body. Um, when I speak Chinese, I have a whole different set of gestures and uh, posture than when I speak English. And even my voice is higher when I speak Chinese than English. So anyway, all of these, um, I guess, non... Uh, things that can't be so well recorded, unfortunately, by a website. Um, and so I was wondering about efforts to record these other things. I mean, I guess video is one step of showing body language and gestures, but as um, the other question pointed out, it's like you learn a language better if you can eat their immerse food. Yourself if you can, in, yeah, indeed. immerse yourself. So how, how to do that? Therein lies the challenge. And you know, this is triage. This is not perfect. There are clear examples, especially here in the United States with the Native American cultures, where a language has gone extinct but was documented and is actually being brought up. And a language is not a frozen moment in time. We aren't frozen. Look at the language of the internet. So languages come and go, languages evolve. So we're not trying to recreate a human park of, of the mind, but allowing them to have a language, allowing us to have a language that evolves and changes. And so again, it's imperfect, we do the best we can. Some die off, some thrive, but inherent in that act is also an act of pride, an act of saying, I am Quechua, I am Yoruba, I am Mandarin Chinese, whatever it is. And I think we all need to have affirmation that we're human and we mean something. And I think there's nothing worse than gutting a culture and a, a group of humans in saying that your language is irrelevant. And I think we live in a moment where that's changing. I work with technology at the Media Lab and would love to talk more if you're interested. Would be honored. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And if you have any more questions and interested in the book, I'm here. Thanks for coming. Good night.